medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram video. You've got this EKG on somebody that's come into the emergency room feeling weak and tired, and you see something on here that's very disturbing to you, and you know immediately what it is that you have to do. Hi, this is Dr. Roger Schwell. I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician. We're going to talk about EKG and a specific case where this patient with COVID-19 came in with rhabdomyolysis. What's rhabdomyolysis? Well, it's basically where you have muscle breakdown and the release of the contents of a lot of different cells, mostly muscle, which causes a condition of high potassium. We're going to talk about what that looks like today. High potassium could end someone's life really quickly with cardiac arrhythmias. It's one of the most controlled electrolytes in the body. And if you were to do an EKG, it would look something like this. You can see this over here on this side. What we'll typically see is the lack of P wave. So a P wave would normally be a little bump right here before this QRS spike right here. This is known as the QRS complex. And then afterwards, you would get this T wave. Now, the T wave normally is just a little bit of a bump like this. We rarely see it this high up. We call these peaked T waves. And there is a lack of P waves here in lead one. In lead two, we don't see it. In lead three, we don't see it. And notice that these T waves that happen after the QRS complex are in most cases throughout this EKG taller than the QRS complexes. That should never really be the case. And that's a sure danger sign that something is not right with this patient. And the thing that is not right with this patient is rhabdomyolysis, which is this condition where muscle breakdown occurs. Now, this can happen in viral infections, but it can also happen in injuries like crush injuries. Trauma can cause rhabdomyolysis. It's actually very common and unfortunately seen quite a bit where structures collapse on people and they're trapped. They'll have crush injuries of their muscle. The other thing that can happen where rhabdomyolysis can occur in people who work out. If they've done a particularly strenuous exercise, they may notice that their urine turns really dark, like almost tea colored. And that is the breakdown of muscle being dumped into the urine. And that's rhabdomyolysis. And if you're seeing that, there's also a chance that potassium levels could go up as well. In this case, we see a case report of a COVID-19 infection where there is inflammation and also this occurs. And let's take a look at this paper, what they said here. Rhabdomyolysis is a known complication of viral and bacterial infections. It's characterized by the breakdown of skeletal muscle, leading to the release of muscular components into the blood. And that's the key there. Remember that cells are very rich in potassium. And when they break, that potassium is going to leak out into the bloodstream and also into the tissue space. Space, and that's going to cause hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia is the term that we use when your potassium levels are high. And so you'll see not only hyperkalemia, but you'll see myoglobin, which is causing the urine to turn dark, creatinine kinase, and this lactate dehydrogenase enzyme, which you'll also see in the bloodstream. So of course, the clinical diagnosis is seeing this patient weak, but that's very nonspecific. The definitive diagnosis, of course, is getting a CHEM-7. And you'll see on a CHEM-7, it's divided this way. And in this area of the screen is where you'll see the potassium. If it's listed on a CHEM-7, it'll also be listed on a list. And generally, it is anywhere from 3.5 to 5.0 normally. If you're starting to see peak T waves, it's probably upward at 6 or 7. And that's pretty high. By the way, I'm showing this because there's a lot of things that you need to know, not only about potassium, which is K, but also sodium, chloride, bicarbonate, the BUN, and the creatinine, and the glucose. And of course, we go over that at medcram.com in our BNP Chem 7 results explained clearly. So I invite you to check that out if you want to know more information. For those of you who are familiar with EKGs, you'll notice that there's a little bit of bradycardia here, so that the heart rate is slowing down. And the way we can calculate that here is by looking at the time between each QRS complex. It's starting to slow down. It was probably a little bit faster. In this case here, it's 81, which is still in the normal range. But the way we do this is we count the number of boxes here between the two QRS complexes. So if we go here, that would be the first box, the second box, third box, fourth box, and finally the fifth box. 
and realize that when you have things that are right on each box, it starts at 300 beats per minute. The second one would be 150. The next one would then be 100. So 300 divided by three boxes would be 100. The next one would then be 300 divided by four, which would be 75. And then finally, the next one here would be actually around 60. So the rate here is around 60 beats per minute, even though this is saying 81 up here. And that's interesting because I actually had a very disturbing experience once. I was called in to see a patient that had recently been intubated for difficulty with breathing. And as I was standing there in front of the patient's bed, it was a young person actually, developmentally delayed. And his mother was there. I was getting a history from her. And I was standing there in the room and she was giving it very calmly. And I remember distinctly looking up at the monitor and seeing that his heart rate was just like this. It was like around in the 70s to 80s. And I got a little bit more history, looked back up again, and noticed almost subconsciously that it had drifted down into the 60s, which was a little bit odd. And after a few more minutes of taking history, I looked back up at the monitor, and now it was down into the 50s. And I started to see this peak T wave started to occur. So something was happening acutely right in front of me. So I went back to the chart really quickly to look as I had just come in to see the patient and I had noticed that the patient was intubated. And when I looked at the patient's labs and the medications he was given for the intubation, I noticed that his potassium was already in the five to six range and that he had been given a medication called succinylcholine, which is a paralytic that are often given when the patient is intubated. And unfortunately, succinylcholine is a depolarizing paralytic, which means that it causes depolarization and a release of potassium from the cells, at least initially. And so this probably exacerbated his potassium levels, and he was going into cardiac arrest literally right in front of me. I picked up on this pretty quickly because I had been trained about this very issue. The thing that they train you about is that there's many things that you can do to get the potassium back down. You could give, for instance, albuterol. You could give bicarbonate. You could give a binder in the intestine called lokelma or kaexalate you could do insulin and glucose. There's a number of things that you could do to bring the potassium down, but none of those things are going to bring it down in literally seconds, which is what you need to save this person's life. What you do need at this point is something to stabilize the membranes on the myocardium. You need to stabilize the heart. And for that, we are well trained to know to give calcium. So I was asking the nurse to come over immediately and to pull out of the crash cart calcium because we could not get calcium fast enough from the pharmacy. I literally needed it at that second. Otherwise, the patient was going to code and die. And the nurse was able to quickly locate the calcium, draw it up into a syringe, and push it immediately, upon which the patient straightened up in terms of his EKG findings and went right back to normal. And I tell you, it was the closest thing that I've ever had in my entire career to something that you might see in the old TV series ER or in something like in House. Looking at the EKG, being able to rapidly understand what was happening at that moment, being able to look on the chart to see what had happened and acting quickly to literally save someone's life in that moment. Some of these things that we talk about in critical care medicine are things that you just have to know and need to be able to respond to and see. And this is something that really stuck into my mind when we're talking about peak T waves. And if you want to know more about that, Highly recommend looking at our EKG interpretation explained clearly at medcram.com that goes over all of this. What's interesting about this is that you don't necessarily need to have a 12 lead EKG. You can actually have just one of the leads, which is lead Roman numeral one, which you have on a smartwatch. Smartwatches have been around for a long time, but some of the newer ones have a feature on it called ECG or electrocardiogram. This feature allows your watch to monitor the electrical pulses that are given off from your heart. So an ECG is something that you might get in a doctor's office or an emergency room, and it's a way that a clinician can look in many different ways at your heart and how it's beating based on the electrical conduction that's going down its conduction fibers. So what is an ECG? It's basically a photograph of how electricity is moving through the heart from many different angles all at the same time. And this can be tremendously helpful in diagnosing very common heart ailments. This is what's known as a 12-lead EKG. And as you can see here, there's one, two, three, times one, two, three, four different leads. These are looking at the heart from different angles. 
lead two is reproduced at the bottom all across the bottom of the page because sometimes we like to see a full 10 seconds of a particular rhythm. And since lead two looks at the right atrium, which is where the rhythm is generated, that's why we usually have lead two going across the bottom. The type of lead that you see in a watch is limited to just one of these leads. In fact, it's this one right here called lead one. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So what you're seeing here looks kind of complicated, but it's actually quite simple. And as you can see here in the upper left-hand corner, we have that red arrow that's going from the right arm to the left arm. It's got a specific viewpoint of the electrical conduction in the heart, as you can see here by Roman numeral one, and what that looks like on the ECG. And if we look at it from different aspects here on the second one, we can see it going from the right arm down to the left foot, and that's lead number two, as you can see there. And it looks slightly different because we're looking at it at a slightly different angle. An additional lead here on the right is lead three, and you can see it's going from the left arm down to the left foot. And that again has a slightly different unique look there as well. And as we keep going here along the bottom, AVF, AVL, AVR, those are again different looks at the electrical conduction there as well. So AVF is looking from the heart straight down to the left foot. AVL is looking at the center of the body out to the left arm. And AVR is looking at the center of the body out to the right arm. And of course, these are the views that you get on a 12 lead ECG. Because you're putting your two hands together on a watch, however, you're pretty much gonna be limited to what you see here in lead Roman numeral one in the upper left-hand corner. And as you can see here, when somebody is wearing the watch, in this case on the left hand, the back of the watch is picking up the electrical signals from the left hand. And what the watch is constructed and engineered to do is when the person touches their right hand to the crown of the watch, as it's called, then the watch is able to get the electrical signal from the right hand. And as you can see there, it's generating an ECG rhythm in lead one. And again, that's where we compare the electrical conduction from the right arm going over to the left arm. And that's picked up here in the watch because the watch is touching the left arm. And as soon as you touch the crown of that watch there where the knobs are with the right finger, that connects the electrical circuit and the watch is able to generate a single lead ECG, in this case, lead one. So as you can see, you can get lead one from a smartwatch, but if you want to get the whole picture of what's going on in the heart from all the different angles, you do need a 12 lead ECG. And again, if you want to know more information about that, join us at medcram.com, where you can see here many of the comments from MDs to nurse practitioners to PAs to nurse practitioner students have all given this very high ratings and comments that are outstanding. So if this has been helpful, please subscribe, turn on notifications, leave us a note, and join us at medcram.com. Thanks for joining us.